Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this evening's live stream. We have a special guest who I will introduce to you in a few minutes. But as usual, I'll talk about a few things in the news and a bit of family party news as well. Well, Ukraine and Russia, that's been in the news, hasn't it? That's the big story at the moment. I mean, the Scottish Family Party, we tend to focus quite exclusively on our uh, Scottish issues, social policy, etc. We don't tend to comment much on our foreign policy. Maybe at the next Westminster election, we might develop some foreign policies. Uh, we shall see. Um, so what's my take on what's going on there? I think what it looks like to me, it's like Vladimir Putin just treats the world like a game. You know, you play a board game and you, you have your various plans, how you can outwit your opponents and achieve your objectives, take some territory or whatever. Vladimir Putin seems as though he's treating this like a game. He's playing a game. And it seems like all the other countries are just not playing the same game. So he's tending just to, to run rings uh, around them. I mean, I, I would be delighted to see a very strong response against Russia. I, I just can't bear, basically, to see bullies getting away with things. Um, so I'd be delighted to see a very strong response and for basically for his plans not to come to fruition one way or another. I think he needs to be to be stopped. Now, old Vladimir Putin, when it comes to a lot of social issues, I'm, I'm right with him. I, I agree with him completely on a lot of issues. His critique of uh, like Western European values, uh, I wouldn't disagree with much of it at all. But that's perfectly reasonable, isn't it? You can agree with someone with one thing, disagree with them uh, with other things. Now, some people will try and say, oh, you see, this is what happens. People with these culturally conservative values, they tend to be the bad people. You know, look at Donald Trump, who you know certainly had his flaws. Let's say, look at Hitler, and then sort of that, that's enough. That, that's enough to make your case. But obviously, there have been people with very socially liberal values as well, who've uh, been tyrants in various ways. I mean, I say, I think more people have been killed in the world in the name of equality or through communism than in the name of, uh, of anything else. Now, Vladimir Putin, um, is he really a social conservative? Well, maybe to some degree. Is he someone that would share, for example, my values, my sort of fundamental understanding of these sort of things? Well, considering that a few years ago, he said that Russian prostitutes are definitely the best in the world. I think you can safely say it's not actually on my wavelength. When it comes to the fundamental underpinning principles of his worldview, we're coming from somewhere different, despite agreeing on some other matters. Anyway, so that's the uh, the Ukraine. What else has been in the news? Well, we've had the uh, the splash in the Sunday Mail, you know, SMP uh, making the age of consent 13 or endorsing sex at 13, as though this was a new story, whereas there was nothing new at all. This has been the case for decades and decades. I made a video. Uh, about that. It is remarkable how that becomes like a big media story. Whereas anyone who was familiar with that issue would have realized that, that was no story at all. That was just old uh, news. Um, that story stemmed from the Scottish government's new child protection guidelines. Now, there's a bit more material in there that I'm going to address in the next couple of days. There's a section about protecting children before birth. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child says you've got to protect the interests of the child before and after birth. So this has got passages in that says things like, if you become aware that the unborn child is at risk of harm, then you need to you know, report this to the relevant authorities so action can be taken. So if the unborn child is at risk of harm, you know, you report it to the police, report it to social work, unless, it doesn't say this, but you assume this is what they mean, unless that's harm is the unborn child being killed. In that case, that's absolutely fine. No problem at all. But any harm less than being killed, it seems that's a very serious matter. I mean, how anyone can write this without realizing just how, well, I don't know what the word is. Ridiculous, ironic, I don't know. They sound a bit too flippant. But just the, the, the contradiction between claiming this concern for the unborn child alongside a, a policy of, of basically abortion on demand. So that's, uh, that's an interesting one. So I'll make a video on that later in the week. I uh, published a video about the uh, sort of anti-Brexit, anti-British, anti-English political propaganda at the City Arts Centre. I say we're neutral on the EU and neutral on Scottish independence, but we're not neutral at councils wasting council taxpayers' money. On, well, it's worse than wasting it, spending it on political propaganda to... Uh, not, that's bad enough. I mean, how many levels is this bad on? But even worse, there's not just propaganda, it's demonising and uh, sort of humiliating opponents 
So that was another story. That story was picked up by The Spectator magazine. It's certainly been on their website. I don't know if it'll be in the print edition, uh, but it's been on their website. Uh, the, the journalist who wrote the article, he did mention the Scottish Family Party in the article, but unfortunately, the editors took out that reference. They've left it in on other occasions, but we didn't get a mention in The Spectator there. Right, what else has been happening? Uh, the council elections. Uh, our list of candidates is growing. We need the magic 59 to get our party election broadcast, etc. Uh, we're not too far off. Actually, we're not too far off. But we want to be well over because you never know. Some people might uh, might drop out at the last minute or whatever. So we still want more people to do that. It seems like every meeting we have somewhere ends up with another two or three people at least coming forward saying, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. I'll, I'll be a candidate, which is fantastic. So if you do want to help with us, as I say, what really helps us is as well as campaigning candidates, we've got quite a few of those, I'm producing their leaflets at the moment, also like non-active candidates who are just going to sign a form, take it to the council office, have their name on the ballot paper somewhere, give the people the opportunity to vote for the Scottish Family Party. And that's a really valuable thing to do. It's a really important way that you can support us because I say it raises awareness of the party because people see it on the ballot paper, see it in the media, and also it will get us into sort of a different bracket of parties with the BBC and STV, wherever else. We'll, we'll be in the, the bracket of the bigger small parties or the smaller bigger parties or whatever, I, I don't know. But it will just get us more media coverage, and that's something that we want. Now, I've just uh, just finished a book just tonight called, uh, you can see that, Against Marriage, written by uh, an academic, I think, at Cambridge University. She's basically arguing that the state should have nothing to do with marriage. There should be no such thing as marriage laws. Uh, so it's very interesting. I can disagree with her completely, but very interesting. Uh, so I've just emailed her, uh, Claire Chambers, and I've said, just finished your book, fascinating. Would you like to come and discuss it on the live stream? We can have a little debate about it. You wouldn't believe how often I send emails like that to people saying, please come and talk. Let's talk about this. Let's have a debate, a bit of a discussion. So what do I think the odds are that Claire is going to reply saying, yeah, sure. I'm glad someone's taken an interest in my book. I'd be very happy to come and discuss the ideas. I would say the probability is something like 5% are the best. Uh, but we'll see. If you see Claire Chambers pop up uh, in the next few months, then she's come back and said yes. But uh, as I say so often, it's like Scotland is a debate desert. You just ask person after person, organization after organization, will you please come on and discuss your ideas? And they just won't do it. They just won't do it. Anyway, so but if you know anyone, uh, particularly someone with a you know a different opinion on one of our policies, one of our policy areas, we would love to discuss with them on the live stream. So if you can find people for me out there, people from other parties, other organisations, just you know individuals who you know, have got different perspectives, and you think they'd be able to come on and present some arguments, put them in touch. See if you can persuade them. All right. One last thing to mention. This is a very important one. Um, we had the protest in Glasgow, organized by Glasgow cabbie, Steph Shaw, who's a sort of social media activist uh, in Glasgow. And he organized this protest against the sex survey in schools, what would it be, two or three weeks ago now? And it was really good. There were about 150 people there. That's not like the usual organizer's estimate. That's about three times higher than it really is. I, I, that's my honest thing. guess. I think there was about 150 people there. Um, it was great. I, I gave a little speech. Some other people spoke as well. Now, uh, Steph's not happy to leave it there. He wants to do another demonstration as well, even bigger, in Glasgow. And it's this coming Sunday at uh, 1 o'clock. And if you'd like to come and join us, that would be fantastic. I'm going to go and, uh, and speak. It's a family party. I mean, personally, I, I don't really organize things uh, on a Sunday. But when something else like this is going on, then I'm, uh, I'm happy to, to go along. We could do with more family party supporters there. I've ordered boxes full of the What Are They Teaching Our Children leaflets we gave away hundreds, if, if not thousands, at the last one, and we want to do the same again. So if you come along, come and say hello, and we'll uh, you'll be able to help giving out leaflets if you'd like to as well. So that is Saturday, 1 o'clock, at BBC Scotland building, Pacific Quay in Glasgow. I say it would be great to see you there. Now, I was thinking about my speech for it. I haven't thought much about it, but there's one thought, thing I thought. I, I thought, if you think about, say, the transgender guidance, about keeping secrets from the parents and leading children down this very damaging road of, of changing gender. And I, I was thinking of saying, you know, if, if the government announced a 1% pay cut 
for teachers. You'd find half the teachers in Glasgow would be marching down Soccer Hall Street into George Square on a Saturday afternoon. They would be up in arms. They would be hitting the streets. There'd be placards. They'd be chanting. There'd, there'd be everything. Whereas when the government introduces a policy that's really damaging to children and it's damaging to family life, how many teachers will turn out? Yeah, but we'll, there'll, there'll be a handful there, probably. I mean, in, in my view, that's a disgrace to the teaching profession. It's a disgrace to the teaching profession. But of course, there are many teachers around the country who are very unhappy about it. Some of them are speaking out uh, in various ways and are protesting about it. Um, but it's, compared to the total of the teachers, it's a very small number. So that, that's one little thing I thought I'd throw into my talk. Right. Let us move on to our special guest this evening. Oh, let's get the comments up. I've forgotten about those. Right, there we are. Right, hello, everyone. Right, our special guest, um, he uh, turns into a pumpkin or something if he stays up too late at night. So we recorded this earlier in the day. Um, so in a minute, I'm going to play the recording. But while the recording is playing, I'm going to be on live and I'll engage with the comments more than I can usually. So uh, comment away and I'll uh, be engaging with those through it. So our special guest is uh, Rick Bradford pen name William Collins, author of uh, The Empathy Gap, which uh, you almost need two hands to hold this book up. It's pretty substantial. It's basically about uh, gender equality issues and the, uh, well, the lack of equality and the uh, the, the bias that's, that's involved in many areas of society today. I have to confess I haven't read it yet, but I am going to read it. Uh, but Rick gave a talk at our conference a couple of years ago. It's very, very good. It's been on the live stream before. Uh, fascinating thinker. Uh, by training and career, it was an engineering engineer and theoretical uh, physicist, but he can obviously turn his mind to all sorts of other issues as well. So I'm now going to uh, say play the video of our uh, chat this morning, and during it, I will be active on the comments. So over to Rick and me. Well, welcome, Rick. Great to have you with us again. We really enjoyed your talk at the conference, and I find it fascinating speaking to you on the live stream before as well. So Rick is very much a regular on the live stream. A long way that continue because he's got all sorts of interesting things to say about all sorts of, of topics. Now, we've got various things on the agenda tonight. Quite often, the agenda for the live stream doesn't go to plan. We don't get anywhere near uh, through it all. But we've got some fascinating topics. So where are we going to start? Well, first of all, welcome, Rick. Uh, Tell well, us where you are again. Remind us where you are. Well, I'm in England, of course, not Scotland, and specifically the um, the Cotswolds in the southwest of England. Yeah. Uh -huh. Have you, you had a battering? We had a battering, yes. Yes, weeks, yes. it was quite it? spectacular. I went up the uh, the local hill where I live uh, at the epicentre of the first storm just to uh, experience what it was like to the full. So it was, uh, it was uh -huh. quite dramatic. And walking through the woods there at the top, there was... Um, it was like rifle shots listening to the branches break in the wind. It was quite remarkable. Funnily enough, there was no one else around, which um, <laughs> is really? probably telling me something in terms of my foolhardiness. <laughs> there must have been something good on the television, I would guess. <laughs> Everyone was saying him. Okay, right. Well, let, let's kick off with a, a question. I mean, you, you suggested various topics. I mean, I think this is a fascinating question. I'm sure you'll be interested in this one. The viewers, uh, are we hovering on the brink of tyranny. Mm. What's your take? Well, I've got a horrible feeling we might be. Um, and of course, the the immediate background to this is, is the last two years of COVID lockdowns and uh, government policies, not just in the UK, but uh, all over the all over the world, particularly Western and Anglophone countries, where the policies that have been pursued seem to fly in the face of all logic. It's not just that one has a difference of opinion, but they do seem to have no sense. And they'll espouse one view one minute and then go completely back on it and on the next. And it does smack horribly of authoritarianism. So you do wonder what's going on. And I, you know, I don't want to be a sort of uh, tin hat um, conspiracy theorist about this, but you have to look at what's been happening and question it. And of course, many people aren't. They just go along with it, largely out of out of fear, I think. Because, I mean, that's the other disconcerting thing that, you know, the, it seems that the project fear of Brexit led seamlessly to the project fear of COVID. And 
and then in the middle of it all you get the likes of klaus schwab coming in with his great reset i don't know if you've read that but my goodness i've done quite a close read of it um i reread my own review of it recently and it's even more alarming than i realized first time once you start translating what what terms like stakeholder management mean uh and what things like um what is it environmental social and government governance mean uh it it's horribly worrying and then in the last week or two we have events in canada i mean ye gods but you know people who get all their news from the mainstream media have no idea what's going on in canada I mean, this came home to me only yesterday when I was talking to some of my friends who only get their news from the mainstream. And they've no idea what Trudeau's been doing. Uh -huh. and, and it's beyond dispute what he has been doing in terms of um, appropriating private funds, in terms of, um, you know, suspending the debate on in Parliament on Friday, wh whose purpose was to debate the very emergency um act that uh, he'd he'd instigated and it was closed down before they could debate it. it's absolutely outrageous uh -huh. i mean it, it's so concerning as to be off the scale yeah so i mean that's where i was coming from with that question it, it no longer seems like a tin hat theory it seems like an ever-present threat so well, uh, what's your take on it richard am i the, 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 going lots off, of points, off lots, cock? Uh, lots of themes there well we could pick up i think this this culture of fear issue I, mean, I think that is a really powerful phenomenon in in britain and europe or the anglosphere i think just the assumption is the responsible the noble the most virtuous response to every situation is the most fearful and to be the most careful and, and timid and to retreat from it and every i mean the, the other day when the winds were forecast there were the bbc were doing the reporting i was listening in the car and they were talking to some people saying and these people are saying, oh, yeah, my, my boss said we could all finish early because the, it's going to be windy later on. And that was obviously that was that was a good boss. That was a good story. They didn't actually find anyone who said, no, actually, my, our boss said we've got some important work to do. So we've got to carry on and get it finished. But you knew that that would be a bad person who did that. <laughs> so you ended up with this culture where virtue and timidity and retreat and fear and you know, the, the, the more careful response is always the better response, always the better response. And there's a problem with that because it's it's just unbalanced. But, but someone's written a, an academic paper. I don't know how influential it is, but it does exist. And they've said in politics, the most powerful motivator in politics is fear. If you can make people genuinely frightened about something, then you, you can motivate them into action. You can motivate them to, to support you. I'm looking at politics recently, but that does seem to be the driving factor with, with a lot of debate and it seems to be the the means a lot of politicians are using to uh to gain support is, is to frighten people about something that's, that's coming in the future now in, in saying that of course that doesn't mean that things threats are not real i mean maybe people are trying to frighten you about something that is absolutely you're supposed to be frightened about but on the other hand once people have realized that this is actually the most powerful motivator to get people uh on your side or supporting your agenda then that raises issues. Do you think that's true about the culture of fear? Is it, is it a wider thing than just politics? Uh, yeah, that, what you say is absolutely right, I'm sure. And I mean, as you know from my ICMI talk and, my, and the last time we talked uh, just under a year ago, my, my big thing at present is the role of uh, morality in politics. Mm -hmm. And um, this is actually an example of, of what I call moral infantilism. Um, and I think when I was I was last on, I, I alluded to Jonathan Haidt's book, The Righteous Mind, mm -hmm. and his analysis of the the moral content of political opinion. Mm -hmm. And he, he and his co-workers have um, got this six component view of of the moral component of political opinion. And um, whilst people of a conservative sort of mindset um, tend to have a balanced view of uh, across all six moral dimensions. People of a more liberal or left wing um, view 
are very strongly focused on the care stroke harm axis um, with some some degree of focus on some of the other things but very strongly focused on care stroke harm and that is what is being it's really another way of expressing it but in terms of care stroke harm rather than fear because what are people fear fearful of the fearful of harm essentially mm -hmm. and so by bigging bigging up that element you're playing to what um you know the liberal stroke left wing view of things is most sensitive to and that's why they react most strongly to it and it's also why it causes division and polarization because those of us who are socially conservative uh, and I know your party is a social, socially conservative party, and my mm -hmm. my view is very much socially conservative. People who are conservative in their view um, will will not be so strongly it will be influenced to some degree by the issue of uh, of harm and being protected from harm, but they're not totally focused on protection. Now I, I call this a protection racket. That's what that's what governments are doing now. They they are protection racketeers. They they're, they're protecting us from disease well when did we give governments the authority to protect us from disease that's surely never f featured in anyone's manifesto but that's what they're doing and and because the conservative view is more balanced we're more likely to be skeptical about it this is why the 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 division line in view is you know if you take pro-brexit and anti-brexit it aligns very much with uh, oh, vaccine skeptics and pro, you know, completely pro pro vaccine, for example, because uh -huh. it's all splitting. Uh, the, the the actual division is defined by the moral dimension and the care harm versus a balanced view of morality. Yeah, that's, that's the common feature of it all, and it runs through other other fact other things as well, other topics in uh, in politics. Yeah. But what were you saying there about Jonathan Haidt's uh, six political priorities, th themes, whatever? Uh, I'm sort of kicking myself that my brain hadn't thought that for myself. I'm very familiar with those, uh, with, with that idea. And I think it is very helpful. But I hadn't really thought of applying it to the coronavirus situation. But I think what you're saying is absolutely right. In that uh, the, the caring aspect, that, ju that just goes to number one. Whereas one, one of the other... Um, of the six themes or intuitions, whatever you want to call them, is, is freedom, isn't it? Um, I wanted to, Jonathan Haidt's point is that, uh, like you were saying, people on the left of politics tend to focus on three of the six, whereas people of uh, more conservative bent tend to focus on all of them. They, they don't say they're not bothered about them, they tend to focus on all of them. I say one of the ones that gets left out is freedom. And I think that, that that's very helpful in interpreting the behavior of, uh, uh, of governments. I think just going back, though, I mean, let's say coronavirus. And this is an interesting thought experiment. Let's imagine it was like, um, you know, 20 times more serious or however many times more serious. So, for example, like 10 percent of fit, able bodied fit people drop dead with it. OK, that's how serious it, it was. What, what sort of government action would you support in the face of a threat like that? Yeah, 10% 10, 10 mortality across all age ranges, across the whole population, across the whole world. I mean, that uh -huh. is an entirely different ballpark, isn't it? Uh -huh. um, what, what, what would you support, though, in that case? You've, you've, you've got me there. I've never thought about that. But certainly you're in, you're in a territory where more draconian policies would start to be motivated. It's rather like the analogy would be with, um, with war. You know, I mean, uh -huh. people's freedoms were very seriously restricted in World War Two, for example, uh -huh. because it was an all out war against a belligerent enemy. And, you, you know, you couldn't not obey the blackout um, uh -huh. rules because then you really were um, endangering everyone's lives. And uh -huh. you couldn't say, well, sorry, I'm not going to join up in the army when you got your call up papers. Sorry, uh -huh. mate. You know, so there are genuine. Um, occasions when responsible government action requires them to take unusual unusual actions but the the problem is here we're indisputably well to my in my view indisputably not in that territory 
Mm -hmm. So the, the problem is they pass, you know, in Canada and in the UK, we passed years ago emergency legislation, which we were told, would, oh, don't worry, it will not be invoked. But it has been invoked in a situation where it's really not justified. That's mm -hmm. the problem. So it's knowing where to draw the line in terms of threat. Yeah. Um, and this yeah. is where bigging up the threat works in favor of those who incline to the authoritarian because by bigging up the threat they can justify invoking um, powers that are not supposed to be invoked in this situation that's no. certainly what trudeau's done and it's really yeah. what has happened in the uk in the last two years because mm -hmm. parliament has not had the degree of control over the government policy that by rights, it should have. Now, it just so happens in the UK, if, gov if Parliament had more control, he would have made things more more draconian because we know what the Labour Party's view is. So, so yeah. that's yeah. A, bit, a bit of a difficult one in that respect. Yeah. But, but of course, in Canada, it's the other way around, where the, where the Conservatives are the opposition. Yeah. But, but in either case, it's, it's wrong to, in, in principle, to invoke extreme emergency powers when it's not truly called for and and it, it isn't it, it, it thankfully it clearly isn't in covid because yeah. you know the, um, the there's a there's a small degree of excess deaths or at least there have been in the last two years whether there will be an excess death when you extend that over several years is uh, well we still don't know but the, the fear though potentially could have been the overwhelming of of health services if we had got to the point where you know people were dying in tents in hospital car parks with with no nurses to look after them i mean i, I think that is something that you should be willing to take pretty drastic measures to yeah, avoid i agree but, but, but I agree. it seemed to be every prediction every dire prediction didn't come out didn't come true and that's not just because the predictions were based on what would happen if you don't do anything even the predictions about what happens it, in the event of lockdowns and measures being taken, they just seem to be so wildly pessimistic. But just go back to what, what you were saying earlier. I think the left-right split is very interesting because people on the left of politics like the idea that, that we need the government to look after us. And that, that the more the government looks after people, the better. So if the government is looking after people, we're going to celebrate that. And we really want to make it clear that that was absolutely crucial. Whereas people on the right of politics are more likely to say, well, you know, we think people can fend for themselves and the best way forward is to let people look after themselves, be independent. OK, you know, the government needs to step in in some particular situations. But in general, you know, we want people to live their own lives. And it's, it's been fascinating to see those two perspectives playing out through the, uh, the, the through the pandemic. I mean, my view is that the like worldwide, the, the trend has been to go very much for the sort of left leaning approach. To, to the point where a lot of politicians, I think what Nicola Sturgeon's found in Scotland, is the more restrictions she imposes, the more popular she becomes. Because people have the mindset of, oh, thanks very much for protecting us and, uh, and looking after us and, and taking the tough decisions. Um, so, yeah, I, I think they've learned that, that that's what works. That that is the winning political formula. But I think in England, the balance is tipped. And I think that the government's realised that this is not the winning formula anymore. I think in Scotland, it, it will tip as well if it hasn't already. But they're, they're certainly playing it for all it's worth in the meantime. Yeah, unfortunately, I think you're right. I mean, it does work because most... But I think part of it is misinformation. But mm. The reason why people are for it is they, they have... They've, they've fallen for Project Fear and they've fallen for it because the mainstream media doesn't present a balanced view of things. Yeah. they're keeping information from people and yeah. and bigging up other information in other words they're propagandizing frankly uh -huh. and yeah. and there's any number of you know why 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 if 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 the media was doing its job it would be asking the questions that we ask but it'd be doing that in the mainstream media including yeah. shock horror the bbc but they don't so for example um when we opened all these nightingale hospitals made them available at great expense and then mm -hmm. they were never used why did they not follow that up with asking questions as to why that was mm -hmm. why why is it that very early in the pandemic in march 2020 
Boris Johnson said very clearly, we're not having a mask mandate because the scientific evidence is that masks don't work. Yeah, and then that. only yeah. a few weeks later, it yeah. was masks are mandatory. Uh, and if you don't wear a mask, you're, you're going to be guilty of killing granny. I mean, mm -hmm. why did the media not stomp on that? Instead, they just left it for us in the, the alternative media, if you like, to, yeah. to say. And, and we were then marginalized and called, we were called granny killers. Yeah. When, when there was a blatant disconnect in the message yeah. and the, the whole the whole story has been full of these things i mean we know from public health data for example that the vaccines don't stop you getting covid the, the, there is evidence from the public health data that they will stop you getting hospitalization or 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 dying of it there's some efficacy in Good. the in the That's severe illness but there's 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 there doesn't seem to be efficacy in terms of in terms of infection and boris Could Johnson, you just ask about that, 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 that just ask about that i've heard a few people talk about this about whether or not the vaccines stop you getting infected right someone needs to educate me on this because far as i'm aware how can your immune system stop you from becoming infected surely your immune system boosted by a vaccine or not surely it can only come into operation once you're infected is that not well I'm, I'm reluctant to argue it based on theory because my medical knowledge is too too scant to uh, to be uh -huh. on secure ground so I'd rather argue it based on on data and if you look uh -huh. at the the data published by um, what do they call them? It's not Public Health England anymore. They call themselves the Health Security Agency now. Uh, yeah. Why have they adopted the word security in the context of health? Mm -hmm. That's something to think about. Um, but they publish the data every, well, quite frequently, every week or two um, on, you know, who's getting, who's getting, who's reporting that they've, they've tested positive, who's being hospitalized, who's dying of COVID and against their vaccination status. So you can look at the data and those reports always say, oh, yeah, but don't don't interpret this table wrongly. You know, don't uh -huh. in other words, don't interpret it at face value, which seems to be saying that people that are vaccinated are more likely to get infected than well, if they're, they're not vaccinated. They're, they're I mean, there may be something the in that. There may, there may be, a, there may be a, um, a selection bias going on yeah. there. So I don't want to press it too much. But Boris Johnson himself said months ago, being vaccinated will not stop you getting COVID. So, but, but despite that, the, the killing granny narrative in respect of masks continues. And the uh -huh. same is true of lockdowns. I mean, the effectiveness of lockdowns, it, it was effective. Lockdowns were effective in China and South Korea. Uh, that's what the data shows. But then their lockdowns were real lockdowns mm -hmm. <laughs> where they, they instituted really extreme policies to isolate people in, in hotels and what have you and didn't let them out, you know, with, with an armed guard. So, yeah. so if you do lockdowns in that sense, yes, inevitably, if you don't have contact with anyone, you're not going to be a spread spread the disease. But yeah. the lockdowns, as it, as they were implemented everywhere else, the well, the, the, there's loads and loads of studies. I plowed my way through over fifty reading them, but the, I'd only scrape the surface. There's loads more, and yeah. when I when I gave up reading the reading the the data, my conclusion was well, there's certainly at least as many papers that says there's no efficacy of lockdowns than the ones that claim there are. Yeah. So at, at the very best, lockdowns are of debatable value at very yeah. best but yeah, you, still you can, you can, go on believing oh no it must be effective yeah. why why you can but understand what's... for example <laughs> boris johnson's position because he knows his political vulnerability is to be seen to not do enough and if he overdoes it who criticizes <laughs> him well virtually no one in the parliament apart from a few of his own backbenchers uh the, the media is basically um, going to not, not going to criticize him. So politically, I think it made sense to be more cautious than maybe he would have done on the basis of the evidence, just because that's that's the way the the political thing's going. I think with the vaccine data, to say in Scotland they've stopped publishing it because um, they said it's been <laughs> it's been misused, which I thought was completely the wrong approach. Now I read the explanations of why they thought it was misleading and being misused, and I thought their explanations were perfectly mm. reasonable. 
Um, that they, uh, I won't go into the details, but they had explained why their figures were misleading. As I say, it was absolutely perfectly reasonable points they were making. But the right thing to do is not to cover up the data. That, that's never going to be the positive. If you've got people who are want, wanting willfully to misinterpret it, you're just pouring fuel on the fire by saying, oh, we're going to keep it secret from now on. You've yeah. got to be open with it. You've got to explain, okay, there's, there's a battle of ideas. You, you've got to you know, try and present your case. But that's what you that's what you need to do. Yeah, I'm just sorry, back but, to the, but, to the, but censor, censoring of any sort will only ever promote distrust. And yeah. and it's it's um, indicative of an intrinsically authoritarian approach to things that we know best, yeah. and we're going to protect you even from information. Yeah, it, it's very paternalistic. I, I think that's the BBC's attitude. The BBC's attitude is, right, this is a national crisis, and we've got a duty to produce the best outcome. So the way we're going to help the nation and do and do good is by uh, we're going to make people sufficiently worried about this so that they take the right steps these are the right steps and so they're, they're seeing their mission as as a moral mission they're not informing or educating or presenting viewpoints they see it as a moral mission they know what what good is and they and that's that's what they want to do um, they, they so are they, the people who know best they yeah. are the people who know best yeah. and they will impose their views on us because they they are the people who know best and we're just little people that are stupid uh -huh. Yeah. That's authoritarianism. Yeah. That's what it is. Now, I, I would say with that, that, there is a spectrum that there would be some areas where I would sort of be happy for the BBC to take that point of view. If someone, say, is you know, pr promoting some idea that is clearly dangerous and damaging to people's health, for example, I think it's fair enough for the BBC to think, right, we're going to make it our job to try and put forward the other point of view and try and undermine this. So, you know, there, there are grey areas. There's not a black and white thing. But I just say with, with coronavirus, I mean, the BBC is chronically biased about, about anything. But with this, again, it's it's seen it's, it's what it sees as its noble mission has overwhelmed what should be its mission, which, which is to present arguments, to educate, to listen to a different perspective. That's gone out of the window. Anyway, let, let's go to Canada. We've touched on Canada a, a few times. I mean, for people who are not familiar with what's going on there, there there's been a massive protest movement, truck drivers in particular, park their trucks in in Ottawa. Uh, one of the main reasons was a vaccine mandate that basically prevented them from crossing the border to America. It basically took away their livelihood because they didn't want to get uh, get vaccinated. I say my, my personal opinion, I haven't got any, well, you know, sort of virtually no reservations about about the vaccines. I, th I think they basically do their job. They're, they're, they're very helpful. But if people don't want to take them, that's fair enough. But what strikes me with Trudeau, it's as though he's just got so stubborn that people who won't do what he wants, he just basically hates them. He can't bear them. He's just got so irritated with them that he's just going to do anything to knock them into shape. And, and it really seems like anything. Yeah, it's difficult to know what's going on in his head. Is, mm. it, is it, as you say there, that, that he is so suspicious of the truckers and people that support them that he actually believes his own rhetoric he actually mm -hmm. believes that they're extreme right-wing white supremacist nazis that want to take over the country you know uh -huh. does he actually believe that guff which is possible um or is that as i've always assumed in the past given that that is such hyperbolic nonsense um is that just rhetoric that's covering up something else? In which case, what is the something else? And that's where you get into what are the pressures on him? And in particular, the pressures coming from the international axis. You know, yeah. to what extent are so called sovereign nas nations still sovereign? And to what extent are even prime ministers and presidents no longer? completely um you know their own agents just, to just go back in, back to Trudeau. I, I think there's there's the two factors there is it's just his irritation that people won't do what he wants even though it's obvious what they ought to be doing as far as he's concerned and then does he actually believe that these are really evil people i i, I think he does i think he does believe that i i, I think um a lot of people they, they live within that bubble but if, if you're the you know, Nicola Sturgeon, I mean, what, what would you think about the Scottish Family Party? 
but she would think we are just evil, nasty, bad people. Um, and that would be genuinely what she would, she would assume all sorts of terrible things uh, about us and we're quite firm in that. So I think it's the two things coming together. Right, so if, if a prime minister of Canada is, is under pressure from other sources, what are, what are these other sources, do you think? Well, I don't know. And as I say, I don't want to be c come over as a tin hat conspiracy theorist, but one of, one of the things that's been um, apparent in this handling of COVID is, is the correlation between uh, different nations in terms of their response. Um, the fact that every, everyone adopted lockdowns so rapidly when it wasn't part of the emergency um, health arrangements to react to epidemics in this way. Um, but they all they essentially copied Italy, who copied China, is my but, understanding. Was that by the World Health Organization advice or the international bodies well, like that? Was, was the WHO advice early on to adopt lockdowns? Was it? I can't so there'd recall. Be the, yeah, there would be other international bodies. I think the the experts as well are probably an international community. I think there's also the there's the pressure as well. Is if you're the odd one out, if you say, okay, this is what all the other countries are doing, but we're not doing it, then you're making yourself very vulnerable to criticism. So there'd be a bit of a following the crowd. So so I think there's explanations to explain the herd like behavior hmm. without without conspiracy any, any, yeah. any sort of sort of hidden yeah, hand you, you you're probably yeah. right there you're probably right so well, I, I, sorry go on. so it probably does come back as you're suggesting to um to the likes of trudeau and other people on the left who really do think the likes of you and i are evil uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's quite comical, though, but the way they present us as being such a threat, because the one thing that's absolutely clear is we have uh, very little in the way of uh, in the way of political influence. I mean, with the best will in the world, um, Richard, your party is hardly likely to be the dominant party in the next Scottish election. No, no, <laughs> so the, the one after. We're, we're, <laughs> the one after, but, of course. Yeah, the next yeah. one, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, so I mean, even if you think we're not we're nasty people, it's uh, it's not as if we're about to take power. So <laughs> uh -huh. I don't know, and, and maybe it comes down to misinformation. Maybe it's um, like COVID. The um, it, there's been so much um, misinformation about people who hold conservative views for so many decades, so relentlessly in in the education system and in 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 the media that um, they, they do actually believe it. It's, yeah. it's, I suppose that is quite possible. Yeah. Just one last thing on the on the tyranny issue. When I hear some people talking about it, that they say you know, the restrictions are they're very authoritarian. And it's as though they believe that, for example, let's say Boris Johnson, that his plan for the future was to impose authoritarian rule on Britain. And he's using this as an excuse to get there. Now, when I hear that sort of thing, I, I don't really buy that. Like even for Nicola Sturgeon, I mean, Nicola Sturgeon is a control freak, um, but I, I don't think she's thinking right. If I can stop people going to the pub and meeting their families, that's a step towards the authoritarian regime that I want to implement. Because I just don't see any connection between that and anything that Nicola Sturgeon wants to do. I think she would like to be quite authoritarian, but but not to do with. Well, stopping people going to the pub, maybe if they're going to drink alcohol, but um, but you know, stopping people meeting their families, whatever. So I don't see any connection between those and a wider authoritarian ambition. What, what do you think about that? That's fair, or no, I'm well, I think the real threat here, in terms of um, let's align authoritarianism with the erosion of democracy. And the, the threat the threat in terms of the erosion of democracy is not coming from within the nation states. It's coming from the international bodies that have influence on all our lives and which are not subject to any democratic mandate. So the United Nations and the World Economic Forum are always to the fore in, in a list of such organizations. But of course, there are a great many others you know, think like the IMF and the World Bank and all sorts of uh -huh. 
other organ, uh, you know, the EU, of course, is one of them, and the Council of Europe is another one. And there's lots of these bodies that are, don't have a democratic mandate. Um, and there is a commonality of view amongst them that actually um, independent nation states are the source of all evil. I mean, they align yeah. nationalism with fascism, um, whereas I've, in my view, that is that that alignment is merely a historical accident, it isn't actually intrinsic to the nature of fascism. And I would say that if there is a threat of fascism at the moment, it is coming from that international axis, the mm. axis that, again, they think of themselves as the people who know best. Uh, yeah. The United yeah. Nations is absolutely, um, you know, wedded to that principle that they they know best, and they're trying to coerce the nation, corral the nation states, in in that direction. And the Great Reset by Klaus Schwab is very much the same thing. It's about um, when you know, when he talks about stakeholder capitalism, what he's actually talking about is world governments and uh, people you know when you start talking about world government they think you're another another you know conspiracy theorist but that's actually what he's talking about he's talking about a a system of uh, large corporations um some government representatives um and very much the the internationalists um having T tying up the way the way things work at the international level which subverts the power of the nation states and therefore since democracy only operates within the nation states by that process undermining the uh, the democratic mandate i mean how do we how do we influence these international bodies through the ballot box and so we can't because we don't vote yeah. for any of them yeah well, so that's United that's the, that's where i see the threat coming from it's a gradual erosion of the the democratic process through that axis which is not subject to any democratic control no. No. but just i mean about world government I mean, there are people who openly call for world government they think we should set up some sort of democratic system yeah. i would argue a democratic system covering the whole world it just doesn't work. Everyone's individual influence is so diluted. You've basically got no influence. The United Nations, though, has simply been captured by progressive activists. It's as simple as that. I mean, they are pushing a political agenda. But the countries like Britain, Scotland in particular, they just roll over and accept it because they say a lot of it's under the, under the banner of human rights. So you know, if you're going to be signing up for the United Nations Convention of Human Rights, then you have to have an Equality and Human Rights Commission or a Human Rights Council or whatever. Now, what these bodies do is they basically go and ask the United Nations to tell the country how to run their own country. Yeah. Um, and you can see that basically underneath it is a good idea. The idea of the United Nations upholding human rights. Great. I mean, go to some countries where prisoners have been tortured and tell them not allowed to do that. Otherwise, we're going to do this, that and the other. Great. But it seems I don't know how much of that they're doing, but they come to countries like Britain and say things like, you know, you shouldn't have Catholic schools or uh, you, you can't you, you've got to have a smacking ban. You have to have hate speech legislation. You have to allow abortion because this is all part of human rights. And if you want to if you don't want to be criticized as a you know, human rights violator, you have to do these things. Um, I mean, in Scotland, it's, they, they really love it because what the UN wants to do is what the Scottish government wants to do in any case and they're, they're sort of pals but uh, surely countries increasingly have got to be saying to the un you know just forget it we're, we're not interested in it. thanks for your opinion but we're not going to do that we're going to do something different there's just, just one last thing you said about the eu i, I think the anti-democratic culture in europe in particular is a lot more powerful than people realize because there's a really strong belief that look at hitler that just shows what happens when you have democracy if you just let the people choose, you're going to have Hitler's popping up every now and again. And that's really terrible. So instead of the people choosing, we need a, a higher level of, of people like us instead, just to make sure that they, you know, those voters don't get it wrong again. And, and people believe that very strongly. I, I think in the European Union in particular. So you're right, yeah, democracy is under threat from mm. above by these uh, supranational bodies.
Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that's right. That is absolutely their view of of um, nation states with sovereign power. That it's the breeding ground for for fascism. And but they seem to be totally unaware that what they're doing themselves is fascism. It it it. You know, evil has a way of breaking breaking forth in every generation, and it, it takes a superficially different guise, even though it's it's fundamentally the same and i believe mm -hmm. that what they're doing is is actually fascism what mm -hmm. what Klaus schwab is is uh, promoting is fascism it may may sound lovely on the social front but economically what is proposing is is a, is a public private partnership in mm -hmm. other and that's that is incidentally how uh, mussolini defined fascism it's mm -hmm. when the state takes control of the capitalist process. It's what's happened in China. The reason uh -huh. why China's become so powerful. I mean, Mao, of course, produced a China which was genuinely Marxist-Leninist. And it was a, an economic catastrophe. And uh -huh. every leader in China since Mao has moved more and more from Marxism to outright fascism and Xi Jinping is pursuing an outright fascist line in which you have the social control of Marxism allied to the state control of a strong capitalist economy which is the worst of both worlds it means you have a strong mm -hmm. economy uh, in in the hands of people of a, a Marxist authoritarian mindset that's that's why China is so appalling but yeah. what and, and Klaus Schwab has openly admitted he, admi he admires the Chinese system. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's trying to implement. He may think that he can he can implement it without the shortcomings of, of China. But he's wrong because, you know, it, it, what he's doing, the, the, um, the downside of it is intrinsic to what he's doing because it's authoritarian to the core. Yeah. But with China, in their defense, they, they did donate some pandas to Edinburgh Zoo. <laughs> so it seems like I, I, I think they'll have more influence on public perception of China than anything anything about the, uh, the, the the problems of what's going on in the country. Right. So that, that's uh, that's point number one of our six point agenda. <laughs> so let, let, let's move on to. I think this one follows on quite nicely. So um, we've talked a lot about polarization, division, uh, real divergence of political perspectives what's the solution to that are people going to come together again is there going to be um, a, a healing mutual understanding what do you think is there a way forward with that well it's a real a real issue isn't it as i alluded to before these divisions are getting deeper um, and it seems that on every important topic it's just another excuse for the same alignments to divide divide even mm -hmm. further and uh, you know, I, and I do align this with um, the moral axis as being the common denominator between all the different different topics. Uh -huh. um, so if I have no idea how it can be done, because it's it's very resist and it's very resistant to being healed because it's morally based, be uh -huh. because once something becomes morally based in somebody's mind, you can't attack it with facts. You can't attack it with with empirical data. Because they just they will only ever interpret empirical data as you trying to justify something which is morally wrong. Uh -huh. Th that's the problem. Uh, this is why if you confront people with the data on mask mandates and, and, and lockdowns and so on, they'll still say, no, you, you, you must wear masks and you must, we must support lockdowns and all this because otherwise you're killing granny that's what it comes uh -huh. down to it's it is a moral infantilism and it, it does come back down to this um this uh the fact that the fact that the moral sense in in the public has been infantilized onto the care harm axis and 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 without balance you see the, there's a great attraction to people to become infantilized in this way because it makes life easy. You see, if you think about it, if you if you only have one moral dimension, then you ne you're never involved in moral dilemmas. Whereas if you have a multi-dimensional morality, 
you do get involved in moral dilemmas because you have to look at the balance. You know, there's on the, on the one hand, there's this, the other hand, one hand, there's freedom, the other hand, there's killing granny. You know, there's, uh -huh. you and I will probably be subject to um, moral dilemmas quite often. I mean, we've exposed one, haven't we? You, you asked, what if COVID was 10 times more lethal? Mm -hmm. or a hundred times more lethal would that change the issue and i think both of us were agreeing well it, pro it probably would and then more authoritarian measures would be would be called for that is where balance comes in you know you have mm -hmm. to you have to balance but that balance is missing once you become infantilized so mm -hmm. if we if we're to heal the divisions i think this issue itself has to be exposed it has to be exposed that what's been happening is is a is a molding of people's moral sense and you probably can't do it to people that have already been thus molded you can probably only do it with the rising generation to try and capture them as they were captured earlier you know mm -hmm. in in decades earlier and and had this infantilism imposed upon them and capture them in in the way of saying well look life's more difficult than that and there is more there is more to life than care stroke harm you know and this is where you'd get into the education and the therapeutic education and all that as being relevant to it mm -hmm. yeah well i found one of my great frustrations here i call scotland the debate desert often because we try really hard to get people to come onto this live stream for example from other perspectives so you can just talk about them but it's virtually impossible to get on to do it um, and I think the main reason for it is I think a lot of people have got the mindset why should I bother talking to you where I can spend my time telling the government how to do the, run the country and they do everything I want so, so yeah, what is the point of, of debate yeah there's there's actually a, a deeper reason which which I expound in my theory of moral usurpation it's because the process of infantilization one of its um, strategies is not to debate uh -huh. they don't debate it's the same as say with feminism if you invite a feminist on to debate uh, they, they won't do it they won't they won't turn up and it's deliberate it's because if they debate then they are admitting in principle that a different point of view is is in principle possible uh -huh. but they don't do that they don't admit that a difference of opinion is possible at all they cut it out. Uh, uh, apart from bad people. Mm. Uh, I was talking to um, a, a transgender person, actually, got in touch a couple of weeks ago now. And I said, oh, do you want to come on the live stream and, and debate? You know, we could discuss these things. He said, yeah, yeah, maybe. M maybe I will, yeah. So I said, okay, okay great. Let's, let's look at it. But then he said, I'm not going to come on if there's going to be any transphobia expressed. <laughs> I, I said, well, well, you're either up for a debate or you're not. I mean... Yeah, you know, we'll engage, and if I say something you think's out of order, then you can explain why it's out of order. Yeah. That's that's the way debate works. Um, I said I'll be obviously I'll be, I'll be civil, but we're, you know we're going to disagree about things. Oh, I'm not coming on if there's going to be like offensive and transphobic hate speech. I said you know, he, he disappeared, and that's that's the mindset that's encouraged. Is that that's the whole culture? Is that there's there's nice speech and there's hate speech. Yeah, well, it's ther it's that's what the thera like, therapeu speech. therapeutic approach to education does. Uh huh. Yeah. You, know, you mustn't you mustn't have nasty nasty view contrary views that make you feel uncomfortable. If you're feeling uncomfortable, that's because somebody's been bad. Yeah. You know, you're not and allowed you're being to do damaged. that. You're and being so damaged. and so disagreement becomes becomes hate. Uh huh. Yeah. And then there's yeah. no way forward. There's no discourse way forward. They cut out the possibility of, of the peaceful approach to conflict resolution. Yeah, yeah. Right, we've got, we've got time for one more quick point on the list here. Uh, the Scottish Hate Crime Act included provision for uh, um, adding sex to the list of protected characteristics. Um, uh, and you asked, have they done it yet? Well, the answer is no. There's still a committee working on it, deciding what they want to do. Uh, for those of you who are not up to speed on this, the Scottish government produced new hate, hate crime and hate speech legislation. And it included all, all the usual list of the sacred protected characteristics, uh, sexua sexuality, race, religion. But they didn't put sex in, even though it would have been the obvious thing to do. 
so you could have a, a, a hate crime motivated by hostility based on sex. And the reason they didn't do it is that the government funded feminist organization said, no, 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 we don't want a crime that can be committed by uh, women against men. We want a crime that can only be com committed by men against women. So they want a separate crime of misogyny just to make sure it's completely skewed and, and can't be applied equally uh, to men and women. So even if someone like a, a woman stabbed a man while saying, I hate men, all men are evil, so I'm going to kill you, that couldn't possibly be a hate crime because she's a woman, that's a man. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, if a man makes some sort of sexist joke or whatever, then that potentially you know, could be hate speech, misogynistic hate speech. So the, the committee working on it, as far as I'm aware, uh, is still working on it. And, well, we'll wait and see what they come up with. I mean, my guess would be that they're going to come up with, you know, we do need a, a misogyny law. Because an even-handed hate crime, I mean, hate crime laws, to start with, are completely there wrong. Shouldn't, there shouldn't but, be any such thing as a hate crime law. The the yeah. the very idea of a hate crime law is in, is in itself some, some form of hate, in my opinion. Uh -huh. It's uh, anathema. It's a form of thought crime. And... I mean, I, I don't I don't object to um, judges when they're, you know, if somebody has committed an ordinary offence and they're in the dock for it, then I don't I don't object to judges when they um, pass sentence, um, taking into account whether there was an exacerbation due to, you know, this guy hates black people, you know, and that's what made him do this evil thing. That's fine. I mean, exacerbations or um, uh, or the opposite are part of what judges take into account in sentencing. Fine. But you don't need um, you don't need a hate crime law that erects that element as being a separate issue. Yeah, um, it makes it a hierarchy. It's saying the, these are the motivations that are the really serious ones. If yeah. you just you know beat up the old lady to steal a steal a purse, then obviously that's not such a a, a big deal, or, or you know ha hatred about you know a family feud or whatever, you know that that's not such a big deal either because it's not one of the sacred protected characteristics. It, it's partly to curry favour with minority and female groups within the electorate, but the main thing is it's just advancing this this political agenda that the, the what's wrong with society. Is different groups are treated differently. And so the way forward, the most important issues we need to address as a society are racism and sexism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's it just enacting that political philosophy. Uh, mm. it, and it's incredibly naive. I mean, it's lacking in wisdom, basically, because it's saying, well, we do see that there are, you know, racist elements, say, in, in society, and we're against that. So what we're going to do is we're going to implement racist laws, because that will help, won't it? <laughs> no. <Yeah. laughs> uh, my personal view is, if someone's thinking of beating someone up, I would like them to be just so terrified of the law, regardless of the motivation. Uh, and when people hear of the punishment that anyone gets for beating anyone up for any reason, they, they think, oh, wow, that's pretty tough. I'm going to make sure I don't do that. I, I would like the law to be that that strong. But it's funny, these same people who are really keen, you know, we need to harsher sentences for people who are, you know, homophobic crimes or racist crimes or whatever. Take them to look at crime in general. These are generally the same people who are saying, well, prison doesn't work. Punishment doesn't really help. It just... You know, something must have gone wrong in their childhood. We just need to try and get to the heart of the problem and support the person. But all that goes out the window. Once it comes to the sacred protected characteristics, they become, you know, lock them up and throw away the key people. It's quite interesting. This is rather like split personality mm. on criminal justice. Oh, absolutely. Particularly when it comes to, to sex, of course, because what you're saying very much applies to women, in, and certainly in England and Wales, where the... The ruling is now you must avoid putting women in prison wherever possible. Well, that might be a perfectly reasonable policy. I'm not. I'm not a sort of uh, flog them and throw them in a deep dungeon sort of person. But it might well be that it's uh, it's more constructive to um, focus on rehabilitation than just sort of locking people up in a cell bored out of the mind for ages and ages. I don't know. I don't have any particular view on on punishment other than it should be equitable not based on your sex which it is yeah. at the moment yeah. so. there, there, there were moves in scotland a while ago i haven't heard anything 
about it for a while. They were talking about abolishing, I think there's maybe one women's prison in Scotland. They were, they were talking about closing it down because prison isn't suitable for women. No, well, that's what they did in England. They closed down Royal Holloway, which at one time was the biggest women's prison in Western Europe. Uh, and they were saying, well, we're going to rebuild you know, half a dozen smaller women's prisons to replace that. And then shortly after that, I said, oh, no, we're going to scotch that program of building women's prisons because because our policy now is to deflect women away from prison. Oh, but we're going to continue increasing the male prison population by 10,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. Yeah. <laughs> just, you might not have heard this. The latest thing the Scottish government's come out with is sentencing guidelines that, that basically say people under the age of 25 their degree of criminal responsibility is compromised because their brain isn't fully developed. So that should be taken into account. It's sort of not really their fault because if you're 24 and you, you know, rape and murder someone, it's just, you know, the neurons are just not quite connected up enough at that point. So it's not really entirely your fault. Are these the same people as saying the voting age should be reduced to 16 by any chance? Uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> uh huh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah, uh, that, that makes sense to them. That makes perfect sense to them. And uh, they're saying basically the age for everything um, needs to go down. Children's rights. So the age of, mm. of being able to do anything needs to go down and down and down. Uh, but the age of responsibility goes uh, goes up and up and up. But uh, yeah. On, on it, that, it, Incidentally, the, 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 the answer to your the committee that's looking at whether to put sex in the, the hate crime, Scottish Hate Crime Act, um, why do they not simply follow the time-honoured practice in England and Wales, which is to have, because their, their problem is how can we make this seem gender neutral, but not really gender neutral? Uh -huh. that's, what they're, that's what they're actually struggling with. Well, yeah. there's a time-honoured way of doing that in England and Wales. You have the primary legislation which in, in terms of the letter of the law is gender neutral. And then after you've passed that, you pass guidance, which doesn't go through Parliament, which is just created by the Ministry of Justice. And in the guidance, you can be as biased as you like. So, I mean, the example of that, of course, is the Domestic Abuse Act in England and Wales, which, you know, the primary legislation is gender neutral and the guidance isn't. And we know very well that the application of it will be anything but gender neutral. Uh -huh. It will be skewed yeah. in the usual direction. So that, there's a way There's a way of doing that if, uh, I'm quite, quite if worried you want to that route. I'm quite worried you've given them the idea now. <laughs> what, 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 <laughs> but, to be honest, I think the taxpayer-funded feminist organisations wouldn't be happy with that. I think in Scotland they're much more confident than having to be sneaking it in by the back door with the guidance. No, I think they're quite confident right. they can get the headline. Uh, well, you know, in, in, on that context, in, in England and Wales, I'm not, not up to speed fully on this, but I believe there is a live issue at the moment from the House of Lords pressing for a misogyny crime to be created in England and Wales. Uh -huh. And I believe Pretty Patel has kicked it into touch, okay. saying that wouldn't, wouldn't be the constructive way to go. So that's interesting. Uh-huh, yeah. Well, it's on its way in Scotland. Uh, watch this space. We'll, we'll hear about it when it arrives. But fascinating as ever. Okay, you must come back in a few months um, and talk about, at the very least, the other half of the things we had on the list. Absolutely. I, I, I really do need to challenge you with my, my statement that marriage no longer exists, given, that, 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 your, given that your policy is, uh, as a party is, hinges very much on the benefits of marriage, which, incidentally, I entirely agree with. And I'll tell you um, what, we could maybe talk about that and offer a live stream. We could maybe publish it on the YouTube channel. We'll, on, uh, we'll see about that. And anyway, great to have you with us tonight. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, Always a soon. pleasure. Right, Keep up the good work. Right. Well, uh, I've seen lots of positive comments there. You seem to find that, uh, that interesting. I think Rick's, uh, Rick's a great guest. He's uh, quite a thinker. Uh, we've overrun time wise, but there were lots of interesting comments there. Well, one person said, what does the Scottish Family Party do between elections? Well, that's quite a big question coming up for us, because after the council elections, there's then a three-year gap, if things go to plan with the election date, there's a three-year gap before the Westminster election. So what we're going to do in those three years is grow and grow and grow. Uh, because the party is growing you know, at a very significant rate. We want to be building up and building up so we can have a candidate in every constituency in the next Westminster election. Then we go to the Scottish election after that, and that's again where we'll hope to get some MSPs 
elected. So that's the uh, the plan there. Um, after the council election, which is the 5th of May, two days later in Edinburgh on the Saturday morning, we're having a mini conference. You'd all be very welcome to. Uh, that's the 7th of May. And we're launching a major new policy there as well. We'll, we'll do a press release about it, try and make a bit of a splash about that. So that was something. So the council election will be done. So to keep momentum going. So we're introducing a big new policy um, just a couple of days later. And then we take it from there. So uh, great to see everyone. Thanks for all of your comments. I've been uh, chatting away in the comments a little bit as well. And next week, we've got uh, Tam Laird, who's the leader of the Scottish Libertarian Party. Now, we have a little bit of overlap with the Libertarian Party, but we have quite a lot of difference uh, as well. But Tam is a very entertaining uh, chap. So I haven't actually spoken to him before in this sort of context, but I can uh, guarantee that will be lively and interesting uh, next week. So thanks for joining us tonight and hope to see you next week. Right. Good night. <laughs>